before I get into citizen monitoring, I just want to highlight that it's part of a larger realm that exists out, out there uh, called citizen science which is usually a partnership between public and professional scientists. Uh, could you mute? I have just tremendous feedback. Thank you. Uh, some of the examples of, of citizen science that are going on out there, it's just, just tremendous. A huge amount of work's being done in the astronomy world uh, where people are discovering all kinds of, of new star systems, uh, pulsars, rapidly spinning objects. Uh, these are people that uh, are not employed as astronomers. Uh, much of our information regarding fish migrations is, is being done through citizen science. Uh, and if you take a look, there's a couple photographs there. Those are folks that I think are some of the, the most recognizable of citizen scientists in the U.S. Einstein's uh, Nobel Prizes came from the work that he did off the clock as a scientist. It was work that he did when he was a patent clerk. And Franklin invented the you know Franklin stove, all kinds of different things. And the other gentleman is is Clauber. He is the foremost authority, or was the foremost authority, uh, on rattlesnakes. He was the president of the San Diego uh, Gas Company and the utility district uh, for the county. Not a not a professional scientist. Yeah. So what what exactly is citizen monitoring? Well, citizen monitoring is any monitoring activity of aquatic resources, aquatic habitats, and water quality that relies in whole or in part on the participation by volunteers, students, or non-paid staff. Uh, I try to use citizen monitoring and not volunteer monitoring because we have this mix, we do have people that are paid. We have a lot of, of professionals in the field that when they retire, they also move into the citizen monitoring. So we have a, a lot of experience within the group of folks dedicating their personal, personal time to citizen monitoring. The origins of citizen monitoring within the United States kind of begins back in 1890 with the National Weather Service when they asked volunteers to begin collecting and reporting daily measurements of rainfall and air temperature. Uh, that effort's continued, and now there's over 11,000 of these volunteer weather stations. And this is expanding as climate change has is, is been really stressed in the press, uh, more and more people are signing up for this volunteer program. And up in Canada, they've expanded it to include Ice Watch. Yeah. Now, for water-specific monitoring, the Isaac Walton League, which now has the SOS, the Save Our Streams program, they kind of kicked things off back in 1920 with the first National Water Survey under uh, President Calvin Coolidge's presidency. So what, what's happening now throughout the United States is it's, it's just, just grown tremendously. Back in 2006, uh, a survey was conducted online and around 520 organizations representing 32 states were found. Uh, my students and I went and did a, a similar survey, and we found that there were citizen organizations in every state doing some form of, of citizen monitoring. And worldwide, it's growing as well. Uh, the water keepers have taken off, and they have groups everywhere. Uh, some of the workshops I've held, we have representatives from the Middle East, uh, Mexico, Central America, South America, Phil had called from Canada and, and the uh, EU. So it, it's not just a local phenomena, it's, it's worldwide. Now, taking a look at California, this is an older map, this is from 2003, but within the nine water resource control board regions, uh, eight of them have citizen monitors. Now, 
the number of organizations fluctuates as projects are fulfilled, funding disappears, uh, new issues uh, arise, and new leadership uh, within watersheds appears, the numbers grow. So it, it's a dynamic uh, that keeps me very, very busy. Uh, in 2009, uh, this current year, we have over 200 organizations identified, and most of this comes off of an updated list that was done by a grant activity coordinated by the Monterey Bay Sanctuary. So hopefully in the future we'll have an online and interactive map where you can go to a region or a county and click on it and the citizen water monitors within that area, their contact information will, will pop up and you could either uh, contact them to volunteer, to give resources to, or to partnership with. One of the things we're trying to highlight uh, our local steering teams. There's only only me right now in the clean water team, but there's a lot of folks out there that can help citizen monitors. Uh, right now, I've identified the citizen monitors of Orange County, the San Diego Citizen Watershed Monitoring Consortium, the Los Angeles Regional Citizen Monitoring Steering Team, the Coastal Watershed Council, Sierra Nevada Alliance, and I probably should add on here the San Francisco Estuary Institute, because all of these organizations work together with other citizen monitoring groups to build up capacity to help each other so that each group, with the little resources that they have, they can compound those things and with synergy attack larger issues and get their programs up and running at a very high competency level. So just, just what are these groups that exist out there? It's a huge variety. It's not just limited to nonprofit groups. A lot of RCDs, CRIMPs, uh, and local government agencies are working with citizen monitors. And so I put together a laundry list here of, of different types of groups that exist out there. I've worked with uh, university projects, landowner groups, farm bureaus. We've done a couple workshops uh, with some Indian reservations and rancherias, uh, some local agencies, and, and just a, a lot of environmental organizations as well. Yeah. The diversity is just, just outstanding. The levels that these groups can dedicate themselves to when it comes to uh, watershed assessment or activity varies as well. It can be very simple, it can be very, very complex. Um, the basic level, just education, just letting people know about water quality and that they can go out there and obtain information. That's, that's very basic. Um, what's emerging is participatory sensing, and that's the ability for an everyday person to uh, go out and obtain data for somebody. Uh, the internet and the use of cell phones is, is kind of pushing this. Uh, we haven't gotten into it yet, but it looks like uh, trash monitoring and visual monitoring would be very easy uh, to accomplish with this part new participatory sensing uh, movement. Uh, the visual assessments are things that folks can do for trash surveys or for of photo monitoring, going out and looking at, uh, at BMPs or restorations. It's not going out and collecting a water sample. It's just using uh, training of observation forms and doing an assessment on a, a given water body. Snapshots are events that offer participation to collect information on a given day. We have many different groups that participate in snapshots. The Central Coast uh, Water Council celebrated their 10th snapshot this past spring. Snapshots have been going on throughout the United States for the last at least 30, 35 years, and California for over 10 years. Uh, last one that I participated in, uh, we were able to join with I think about 10 or 12 different organizations. Before the event, we had training and intercalibration of our equipment 
to meet QA requirements, and then went out to the field and was able to uh, conduct not only our snapshot information, but to join with local agencies for inter uh, comparisons where we did monitoring side by side. Okay. Bioassessments is an area that gives citizen groups an easy portal to collect information. The expense isn't that great. Uh, the suite of tools needed to go out there and collect benthic macroinvertebrates is, is small. So if you don't have a large budget, this is an area that a lot of folks can get involved in. Uh, the, the greater expense actually comes from the taxonomic efforts of identifying the uh, benthic organisms that were actually collected. That's an area that's continuing to grow statewide. We also have groups that go out and do sampling. These are often partnerships with local agencies where the volunteer groups, the citizen monitors will go into the field, they will collect a sample, fill out the appropriate data sheets and the chain of custody reports, and then they turn those over to uh, either a lab or the public agency themselves. Next, we have groups that actually go out there, collect the samples, and provide the analysis. They're looking at uh, nutrients, bacteria, looking at uh, many different things. And then there are those that do water quality condition assessments where it's a, it's a very, very in-depth program. Uh, some of the groups are doing mercury studies, looking at copper, uh, looking at uh, the effects of fire in a given watershed, it gets very, very sophisticated. Uh, those groups usually have been around for quite a while, and those projects are, are usually well-funded. Not the program, just that little project. So again, some of the diversity of the uh, projects out there. Acquiring baseline data, huge need for that long-term monitoring, conducting bioassessments, first uh, flush monitoring, addressing BMPs uh, for stormwater, beneficial use attainment studies, uh, special studies regarding toxicity, um, swimming investigations, looking at both freshwater and saltwater beaches. Uh, folks have participated in the International Pellet Watch, which has contributed information looking at persistent organic pesticides. This uh, a tremendous amount of diversity within the projects done by citizen monitors here in California. Um, I'd like to, to highlight, you know, this myth buster. Citizen monitors can produce usable data. Citizens are just folks that aren't being paid to go out there and collect data. But concepts like accuracy and precision definitely are applied. These programs are operating under quality assurance project plans, which are based on EPA and SWAMP guidelines. And they are being implemented. And we also hold intercalibration exercises to, to implement these plans and to strengthen our programs. So the data should be accepted and, and used just as data from any public organization. Now, there's a huge place for these citizen monitors. Uh, the public is in control of what we do with our resources. They're out there. They see what's happening. It's, it's public people, uh, our agencies, our private sector that are doing things within the watershed. And so these are the folks that can actually make something happen. And so I found a couple quotes that I think are really pertinent uh, in regards to conservation. This is from uh, Molly Beattie. Uh, At some point, the will to conserve our natural resources has to rise up from the heart and soul of the people, citizens themselves taking conservation into their own hands, along with support of their government making it happen. And then regarding partnerships, this comes from Alexander Graham Bell. Great discoveries and achievements invariably involve the cooperation of many minds. You know, citizen monitoring brings those people that have a desire to restore their watersheds and to the willingness to partner with others so that they can achieve those goals. There's a, a huge need for data. 
we have a lot of places within the U.S. and especially in California where we just don't have any information. That's a huge need for these partnerships and for watershed organizations to to participate in, in taking care of our watersheds. It also helps us when we start implementing our water quality improvement programs. Uh, stakeholder involvement is, is very huge, and within the Watershed Management Initiative, it highlighted citizen monitoring as a portal for getting people involved in proper stewardship of our watersheds. Citizen monitoring is also part of science-based stewardship. It's producing actionable data, data that can be used to correct any pollution events that we have within our watersheds. Uh, we can't correct things if we don't know what the problems are. And if there aren't any problems, that lets us save our resources and, and move them into areas uh, that may have issues. And also for the implementation of adaptive management plans so that we can continually improve upon uh, our, our yearly stewardship of our watersheds. And citizen-based communications are, are huge. Through our citizen monitoring groups, we create within the community awareness of issues in our watersheds, educate them on what's happening within the watershed and with their daily activities, and then giving them action so that they can improve their watersheds. Now let's move into the clean water team. The, the mission of the clean water team is to build and support the state's watershed stewardship. And, and this is done in order to reduce and prevent water pollution and to recover lost beneficial uses. So if taking a look at the state, we have nine different regions. When the clean water team first started, it was uh, back in the late 90s, the dream from uh, Gwen Sterrett, who was based out of Sacramento and, and getting involved in citizen monitoring to create this clean water team. In 2000, when I first started with the program, we had four full-time people dedicated to the program. One was based in Sacramento to kind of coordinate the coordinators, and then we had three people spread throughout the regions, uh, each dealing with a, a different geographic sector, one dealing with the North Coast, Central Coast, another with the Central Valley and the Sierras, and then the South Coast region. Uh, I was the guy in the South Coast, and now I, I'm the team. I do it from uh, Oregon all the way down the border with Mexico. And what's interesting, we have citizen monitors that are monitoring the uh, Chilkat, which is the watershed right on the border. In fact, the um, the Ag Inspection Station, uh, as you go into Oregon on the Highway 1, that uh, you, you drove right over that little river as you were uh, approaching. And then uh, we have citizen monitors that are doing, act actually a couple that are doing activities in the Tijuana River watershed to the south. So it's, it's, a, it's a big, big spread of territory and, and just one guy right now. Yeah. So what are these clean water team services? What do I get to do for these wonderful folks that are taking care of our, our watersheds? Well, we offer outreach and communication, technical assistance and, and quality assurance, assistance with training, equipment loans, event support, and information management. The tools that we have right now for communications is limited to a, a self-subscribed email listserv, and I provided the um, link so that you can sign up if you haven't already done that. But there also exist some other clean water team tools uh, that we direct people to. Well, they're not really clean water team tools, but uh, we like to, to, to use them to grow participation. And that's the Volunteer Monitor Listserv. This is actually a national listserv, link in with the uh, community that exists throughout the United States. And then also the Citizen Clean Water Improvement Network, uh, CC uh, Winnet, which was started by a citizen monitor in the South Bay area. And uh, I'm on there. If you need to communicate with me, you can actually reach me through there. Technical assistance is, is pretty broad. Uh, we provide programmatic planning, helping groups 
uh, actually design their, their investigations and their programs, uh, assisting them with the project development. Uh, we have online the Compendium for Watershed Monitors, which is a huge document of SOPs, fact sheets, uh, you name it, if it can help you with uh, a component of a, of a water investigation. We got it in there, or it will will get in there. I'm updating it right now, and I'm probably going to be adding 30 some odd new SOPs and, and fact sheets to it. Um, we also have uh, assisted groups with safety, uh, safety protocols, procedures. Um, some of that can be found in the compendium, and then we also provide equipment loans as well. So I'll go into each of those. Um, the training that I've been able to provide is training the trainers. And these are people that would be in charge of a citizen monitoring group and field people. So they actually are then able to go out and provide training for their group as well as others within their watershed. And this is what I've been trying to focus most of my uh, energy into when it comes to training. Uh, but I do go out and provide field crew training. Uh, this is especially true for the first year of groups going out and doing bioassessments. Uh, we also provide measuring uh, water quality for uh, lab and field measurements. Uh, the field's the basic, basic suite, and the lab, it's been mostly bacteria monitoring using IDEX and then nutrient monitoring. We're also launching a new program for uh, optic brighteners, and this is a way of tracking uh, potential sources of septage leakage. Uh, rapid bioassessment has been a huge component of my training activities. This last year, I think it was about 50% of the workshops that I conducted were dedicated to rapid bioassessment, and that's looking at benthic macroinvertebrates. Uh, we've also provided data management workshops, QA workshops, and when I'm not available, we have the Swamp Field Methods course, which is available as a CD as well as online. Equipment loans have been a busy part of my time this past month, sending out equipment to folks that need tools uh, or need to look at various pieces of equipment before they place an order. Uh, we've been able to provide short-term loans of equipment if it's within the inventory. So I have a little snapshot there. The diversity of tools available uh, it has been meters, kits, IDEX, uh, bioassessment gear. It, we have a list that we've been maintaining uh, you know, this inventory on. Uh, gave an assignment to one of my students to take that list, match it up with photographs, do an actual piece-by-piece -piece count, and we're going to be able to share that electronically with groups that uh, that need some equipment and don't have the budget. Or they have the budget, but they want to be able to try a few pieces of equipment before they make that uh, the big purchase. Uh, so been exchanging lots of equipment. Uh, groups also have excess equipment or reagents at times, and and we can either receive that and make sure it gets used or facilitate that the equipment goes from one group to another. Uh, just recently, a, a group in Ventura County restarted, and they were able to meet with the group that had been doing some monitoring but isn't active, and they've actually transferred over many thousands of dollars worth of equipment from one group to another. So it's exciting to see those things. Uh, we've had equipment sitting inside regional offices that was either functional or could be made to function and made sure that that was actually placed in the hands of citizen groups so they could go out there and uh, and get use of it, go out and generate data. In terms of quality assurance, we have many different things that we've offered in the past and currently still offer. Uh, the first is this Swamp CD. And even though this is a training product, I like to stress that we do use it for QA because it's uniform training. We try to make sure that everybody is is trained the most, you know, in a proper manner, that is documented and it's standardized uh, and trying to do it standardization across 
watersheds throughout the entire state. Uh, we also have QA tools within the Clean Water Team Compendium. Uh, we've Right now, I'm serving on, on several technical advisory committees, uh, as my time allows. And that's something that all of the prior uh, clean water team coordinators were able to do. I've also, you know, this afternoon, if I can, I can last, I'll be reviewing a couple quality assurance project plans. And that's something that uh, any group can can ask. You know, Eric, would you mind taking a look at our QAPP, or, or how do I write a QAPP, and uh, and give them assistance? Also online, Swamp has the new QA Advisor, which is an online tool that helps you write your QA plans. Fantastic resource. Uh, we've also been able to participate in intercalibrations. Uh, most of those have been uh, that I've been affiliated with or here in Southern California and in the uh, the Sierra area. I love to see those expand. With, uh, I need a budget to make that happen. So we're, we're trying to get the budget so I can go out there and facilitate these intercalibrations. But in the meantime, I can always assist groups so they can understand the mechanics of doing intercalibration so that they can use each other's data. Uh, I also can help with field reviews, and this is going out in the field and watching your field teams in action and providing comments so that they can improve their techniques and you get better data. Uh, we've also had some larger QA projects that we've done in the past. Uh, Benthic macroinvertebrate taxonomy, uh, we put together with the cooperation of Fish and Game and, and the uh, Chico State uh, uh, Lab, a benthic macroinvertebrate family guide, which is found online. And then back in, I think it was 99, 2000, 2001, uh, some monies became available in which the Clean Water Team put together contracts to provide QA officers and technical support uh, in a couple of different regions. Information, information management is, is a big issue, and we have two different ways to help people. Uh, the first one is found in our compendium and within the Clean Water Team toolbox, and that's the data management system. Uh, it allows you to document your field data, your QAQC, uh, store your data, retrieve it, share it, and it has some presentation tools. And I have a, just a little, little glimpse of it there. It's a very, very powerful tool. Uh, and then through the non-point source grant with the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Foundation, an online data management tool uh, will be made available in the future. And some of its features actually come out of the information management that Clean Water Team has within the compendium. If you need a workshop on this, we, we'd be glad to help out. We've done a few, uh, just a few workshops on, uh, on data management within the last couple of years. To kind of highlight some of the contents of, of this system, the project file, uh, if you have a data that you've been able to generate in the field, look at all the different things that it can be tied to, you know, your organization, you know, your sampling efforts, you know, the actual physical worksheets and test files, your site locations, your lab QAQC, the actual instrument that produced the data, its calibration the standards that were used in this calibration, or the wet chemistry that was used uh, within the kit to actually produce that data point. Uh, those are all the types of things that go in to make your data strong and usable, and we can support you in those efforts. Other things that we've done to help groups is event support, such as the National Secchi Dip-In, the International Monitoring Day, snapshots and first flush monitoring. Some of this has been providing equipment to groups, loaning large sets of equipment for their one-day monitoring, helping them with their QA beforehand, or doing training. And that continues to be a, a wonderful part of what the Clean Water Team can do because it generates such a large amount of data from just a little bit of my time. So 
if you have events or would like to get involved with, with any of the, these things that I've listed, just get a hold of me. Glad to help you. And sorry I went a little bit long there, but that's it. Bell? Oh, can you spend a couple minutes just going to the website? Sure. Cool. Thanks. Okay, here's the Clean Water Team webpage. It's found within the water issues, programs, within SWAMP. We have lots of different tools here. Highlights the Clean Water Team toolbox. Click on that. And it gives you several different things here. The basics, how to just start your organization with some very simple SOPs, um, you know, basic data quality management for your field sheets, your calibration sheets. Um, we also have conventions on naming equipment so that you can tie each piece of equipment to a particular data point. Part two is a data validation kit, and we have some advanced tools as well. To, you, so you start getting into things, you realize that you need extra support, need to define other parts of your program, and we have those tools already for you. Yeah. Most groups start small and they grow, and we have all those tools to facilitate that development. The Clean Water Team Guidance Compendium. This is huge. A uh, compendium is just a, a large gathering of interrelated objects. And so we have standard operating procedures. We have fact sheets that describe different uh, analytes. And let me just scroll through here. Uh, how to use the compendium. Please go to that if you haven't used our, our compendium before. Uh, what is good data? Very, very nice presentation that's been put together for you. Field procedures section two is probably the one that's used the most by groups. Uh, talk information papers give you a course overview of a subject matter, and the SOPs go into depth on a particular activity. Um, grab samples. We have fact sheets in English and in Spanish that talk about what is dissolved oxygen. You know, what is temperature? Uh, we're also going to be adding on to this some additional uh, fact sheets in Spanish. We also have a uh, bioassessment that's going to be made available in Spanish. Uh, trash assessment is becoming uh, an activity that more and more groups are doing. So rapid trash assessment is something that I've been supporting, and we're going to be adding a couple of PowerPoints that I've done, so it makes it easier for folks to, to understand what rapid trash assessments are and how to conduct those. It'll be very, very heavy with the pictures. Um, other resource materials, you can go off this and, and look at what's available by EPA. EPA has a lot of different activities that are going on. Uh, litter butt website. New information has been released showing the toxic effects of cigarette butts. Smoked and unsmoked, they're both equally toxic. Uh, 